Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Connections. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by the incredible Irish violinist, uh, Mairead Nesbitt. Hi, Mairead. Hi, Natasha. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Such a treat. I was telling you before this, like I've listened to all the Celtic women with my family. We used to just watch you guys and it's such a treat to speak with you. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. You know, those, those days were fantastic and you know, such great music. And uh, I'm so excited to, to talk to you about what's going on with me. Absolutely. So we'll just quickly, if I can go back and then we'll come to where you are today. Um, you've said you got started late as a violinist. So what does late mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, late is six, six years of age. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I started the piano when I was four and um, then the, the fiddle and violin at six years of age because my mother and my sister and my father, all my family play music. Um, uh, they're all amazing musicians. I come from a very musical family, so I'm extremely lucky. And um, the piano, it was just such a great foundation instrument for classical music. And uh, of course, the tin whistle then is a great foundation instrument for traditional music. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fantastic because it gives you um, a grasp not only on your melody treble hand but uh, har harmonies as well for the bass hand as well so uh, my mother is an amazing uh, fiddle player and uh, music professor as, as as is my father john as well kathleen and john so um basically that's how we all started just really like living and breathing in 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 our house and um just playing music together Sounds a bit like like the Von Trapp family or something. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit like that. <laughs> so now, you know, once you've picked the violin, can you tell us, I, I feel like a lot of people almost think the fiddle and violin are two separate instruments, but they're yeah. actually not. It's the way that you play them and yeah. you've done both. So can you tell us from your perspective, the differences and what it's like to switch between those two? Yeah, it's such a great question, um, especially on classical crossover, which yeah. is a fantastic question. So, um, and a lot of my pupils um, uh, ch get challenged with this as well, uh, because they would be a, a, a very good classical musicians and they want to learn some traditional Irish music. So I always explain to them, well, you know, all the years that you learned your technique and your bow hold and your everything about classical music, your scales, your ornaments, your your uh, Carl Flesch scale system, your studies, um, all those years. And they said, yeah, yeah. Well, this is probably the same for traditional music. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's, it's not just, um, you just don't fall into it and just expect it all to happen, you know. But um, really for me growing up, I really wanted to communicate musically with my mother and my sister, who is the most incredible, a violinist and fiddle player and piano player and um i've got four brothers as well who and, and actually it, i think it seems to be a theme in the nesbitt house the fiddle or the violin because my grandmothers um uh, both grandmothers on, on both sides were great fiddle players and also you know everyone in the house plays the fiddle you know so it's 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 almost like you know a given or something in in our house and growing up really i wanted to not just do classical as well i wanted to obviously have um my my i mean it's like breathing as i said uh, my my traditional background and at that time natasha you know when i was growing up anyway it's completely changed now because it's it the road has been paved with musicians like um you know nolly casey maura brannock uh, myself and um just just um young fiddle players now can actually aspire to playing both styles whereas it was frowned upon when i was growing up you know and um really the classical world would turn around to you and say oh you're going to ruin your bow hand or you're going to ruin this or you're going to ruin that especially if they thought you were any good <laughs> <laughs> so um so that was the thing and i i just didn't want to uh go with that and i wanted to play uh traditional music it's a huge um in in terms of world music in general it is probably 
up there in the first three styles of world music, um, traditional Irish music. Um, a lot of people call it Celtic music, but it's traditional Irish music. And um, there's so much to, to learn, you know, the, your ornaments, your bow holes, your um, modes, um, and just the whole vibe of playing. And that is a big thing in my lessons as well online. And, um, you know, people can, the big thing is the, the, I was going to say the big thing is the bowing, but to be honest, both hands are a, a huge deal because um, they really lend themselves to the vibe. Uh, for instance, if you're playing something in 4-4, like a reel um, in a classical bowing, it's going to sound very square. Whereas if you change your bowing to a traditional Irish bowing, which is um, a lot of bow trebles, weaving bowing, the figure of eight, classical mu musicians will know what I'm talking about, about the figure of eight in classical music. Uh, there's a lot of that in Irish traditional music. And then, of course, Irish traditional music has the huge connection with Thurlough O'Carlin um, and uh, with classical, I mean because Thurlough O'Carlin is um, uh, existed around the same time as um, Handel. And uh, of course, the first uh, performance of Handel's Messiah was in Dublin, in Fishamble Street. So um, traditional Irish music is very similar to Baroque and, and late Baroque. And uh, it has that whole improvised um, feel in improvising at that time everybody improvised their cadenzas in classical music uh, a cadenza is a section in a in the middle of a your movement of a concerto and you would improvise your cadenza can you imagine on the spot whereas all the cadenzas now in concertos are all written out uh, yes. <laughs> for, for yeah when you're going to college you're going to as they say going to school over here whether you're going you know to all the all the big colleges so um so in in that way i wanted to uh, embody both styles but do it properly i have two separate bow holes um for classical music and for irish music and also um in terms of vibrato is a big thing not to use in irish traditional music in okay. a way just the tiniest tiniest bit very similar to Baroque music or Baroque music, as they say. So um, there's a lot of similarities with early, uh, um, early classical, late Baroque um, with Irish traditional music. And I really gravitated towards that because I love Bach as my favorite composer. And of course, Vivaldi, Handel, you know, um, Telemann, uh, Giminiani, you know, and it's just so many, so many composers that I love from the early, um, uh, from, from the Baroque era. And um, so I really wanted to embrace that in, in my styles. And I managed to keep them both separate growing up and do my classical exams. And, and actually Irish traditional music now has, it has its own great exams in school okay. and college, thanks to my mother, Kathleen Nesbitt, and um, the TTCT course in Monkstown in Dublin. So it's the only, it's the only one affiliated with the Academy of Music in, in, in Ireland uh, for Irish traditional music. So it's the first of its kind in any country. And uh, so it's just great to have both Natasha, yeah. you know, you have that whole uh, skill set of improvising. You can read, which is fine from your classical side, but also you can you can you can memorize really fast because you have such a good ear and you can leave away your music. I never I never have any music in front of me for any performances, whether it be class, classical rock or obviously oh, traditional. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and it's really, really handy like that. So I've, I consider myself very lucky that I got myself, you know, the best of of all the worlds, you know, um, in in that way, and um, it's growing up in such a family. I I got to to realize that. That's so cool. I wouldn't have thought of that with Baroque, but now that you say that, it makes perfect sense. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit? So another thing that's been very distinct with you on stage has been the way you move, your movement. Um, was that something you were kind of allowed to do when you did in classical or was that more as you branched out and did things like Lord of the Dance, yeah. Fleet of Flames? Yeah. Was that kind of where it came up more? I think, you know, it was definitely when I started doing shows, uh, for okay. instance, Lord, Lord of the Dance, um, really 
I was so lucky with I I I did it a little bit before then. I was in, of course, the the concert orchestra um, in Ireland uh, just before that, and um, um, I started very young with them. and And I was very lucky enough to be with the concert orchestra in RT. And um, then the Lord of that the dance came about. And then um, I think really for me, I loved to move. Um, but I always say to people, really, music is the most important thing first yep. and your technique and practicing to try and get, you know, no one's going to be the best in the world or anything, but you can be the best that you, you can, you can strive to be a little bit the best that you can be, yep. you know, and, and with, with your, um, you know, with memorizing everything that you're supposed to memorize with your, with your bowing, your technique, everything. And, um, and and really uh, the musicality in your performances, and to me the movement was secondary. Mm. I really the the music moved me. If the music moved me, I would move. If that makes sense. And I started doing that um, only because I was given the stage to do it in Lord of the Dance first of all. Uh, with the great Michael Flatley and um, really it it and it was actually very little movement to what I usually do now um, and uh, but it really kind of helped um, it, they just said do, do what you want to do there's your entrance there's your exit the same in Celtic Woman there's your entrance and there's your exit do whatever you want to do in between and it was such a fantastic thing to get that you know freedom on stage mm. and for them to trust me to do that on stage so um i was really really happy about that and i suppose to answer your question really i suppose um a little bit just before lord of the dance would have been when i started to to kind of because really i was a cog and a wheel in 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 the orchestra before then obviously you can't get up and move right. around you'll <laughs> yes. be gone out, you know <laughs> and so i i just felt that um Oh, there's a whole stage here. Look at this. I can I can use this stage, you know. <laughs> so that's how it happened. Um, we do have a question here from one of our patrons that wanted to ask you about this, and then we'll move on to your albums. But um, yes. Karen Chamberlain said, she said, How do you keep your focus and not get dizzy when spinning in circles and still playing at the same time? That's a really good question. Um, really, and uh, that's Karen, is it? Hi, Karen. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really good question, Karen, because dancers, professional dancers are told when you spin, you spin and you focus on one point in front of you uh, for, to not get dizzy. Um, you know, so you're spinning and you're kind of, it's, you spin and you kind of stop and spin and stop, but I actually don't stop. So I don't focus on anything in front of me. Um, but anything that I do, this position here, um, with you know the, the the violin at my neck and um the arms and you'll notice that that very rarely moves mm -hmm. and that's my focus really when I'm spinning so you know it's just focusing on my on my posture and um and that's how I don't get dizzy but I'm sure, I mean, watching you do that, it's so incredible. I'm sure there's, have you tripped ever on stage? You must have. Oh, I've tripped. I've fallen. <laughs> I've, you know, um, and not too many over the years, really. Um, That's awesome. Especially with the years with Celtic Woman. Um, I, I just don't know how I didn't really. I, I have done in Lord of the Dance. Um, I've literally skid across the whole stage and, and my electric fiddle, uh, was in smithereens on the stage <laughs> and I got a big yay <laughs> roar from the crowd and that was really fun <laughs> except I had to go and get another fiddle then but um you know it was it was um I think I think with Celtic Woman um I honed it in very much with the music as yeah. well and um I was given an awful lot more um flexibility because I was the solo fiddle player violinist in Celtic Woman. Um, and it, it just gives you an awful lot more freedom um, because you're not afraid of running into somebody, you know? And um, so, you know, 
things happen and it you know it's uh it gives the audience something to to focus on as well <laughs> <laughs> well you always looked just amazing on stage um but tell us as you've gone so you said you know uh, Fleet of Flames, Lord of the Dance, Celtic Women. Yeah. You've done all these big shows, but then as you started, um, obviously you did your album, I think before Celtic Women, Raining Up came before, is that that's, right? That's true. Okay. That's true. And then as you moved from that into Hibernia, like has your style, do you feel like it's changed as you've been able to do more of the music selection yourself? You know, that's a really good question again. Um, I have the very, um, I'm absolutely so lucky insofar as I have very, very musical brothers and, and sister and family, <laughs> uh, my mother and father who played on Raining Up and who also played in Hibernia. Uh, Carl Nesbitt, you probably, I'm sure you know Carl Nesbitt, uh, multi-instrumentalist. He's um, my youngest brother and he has played on my albums and also my parents and a lot of my family. And um, so I think with the style, um I feel I guess I was going through with Raining Up. Raining Up is one of is is one of my most favorite albums actually because I was going through a real dance phase then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, Ibiza and all that, you know. So um I think um I I think I you know for instance Skidoo on Raining Up. What a great tune written by Steve Cooney and um the most amazing dancey tune and you know the the album was produced by Manus Lonnie Donald's um younger brother and um also um I had great people working with me on that and Colm Fanlu and then on Hibernia it was more orchestral um I wanted to do an orchestral album uh Raining Up was more solo and and kind of electrifying you know and uh jazzy and dancey and um electronic almost you know it's just but it wasn't it was all done acoustically you know <laughs> um and it was real funky and cool which is what um was coming out of ireland and scotland at the time and still is um um it you know i'm really proud of reigning up because it hasn't dated one bit so mm -hmm. i'm so happy about that hibernia then coming into hibernia two albums that were done at the same time as hibernia which is an orchestral album done in Windmill Lane Studios in Dublin, which is, oh my gosh, all the the who's who has recorded there. So I was in the main studio in Windmill Lane and with the the great Brian Masterson, who has done U2 and, oh, everybody, every, all, loads of world music artists and also rock artists and, and, and everything. So um, we did Hibernia, which was a huge, huge, huge undertaking. And then we did the family album, Devil's Bit Sessions. And the Devil's Bit is the local mountain to us in Tipperary that we climb every weekend uh, as a family. And um, so we did a whole family album over a weekend. Now, it took a year <laughs> to organize it. Okay. <laughs> to make sure everyone was there at the same time. But it's a live album over a whole weekend with Love the it. chat in between the, the the tracks and everything. So um, so that album came out around the same time as Hibernia. Hibernia came out first, um, uh, the orchestral album, which um, everybody loved. And um, it, it brought out a side of me, Natasha, that, um, that I wanted to bring Irish music out. I felt uh, Irish music lends itself really well to being orchestrated. And mm. I just felt I'll add to that, you know. I mean, you've got the Brendan Voyage, and you've got, of course, the great Misha era. You, you've you've got a uh, Sean Arida, and um, the Chieftains have done such amazing or orchestrated albums as well as their acoustic albums. And um, I just wanted to to take a, a try at it myself, and I had a, the most amazing orchestra and um, just the most amazing team. Um, so that's the more orchestrated version and then of course then the whole acoustic side of me with my own family was the devil's bit sessions and um that came out at the same time around the same time as well and both albums did very well on billboard and um just in cred in in by way of being credible you know and and into in you know having integrity and um so i'm really really 
happy about that and and really happy that I also got to do an album with my parents and my whole family mm. as well. I think it goes back to being authentic, right? So these things, the classical yeah. side and the, the traditional side, it's part of who you are. And like you both mentioned that both people love those projects because they can see that authenticity coming through, right? And I think it charted in four different areas of the billboard charts or something crazy like that, yeah? <laughs> it did, it did. You know, would you believe it? It was in the classical charts, the classical crossover charts, Heat Seekers and World Music. So I was so happy and it was in the first 10. So, or the first five actually, I don't know. And I think Devil's Bit Sessions um, did, did well too in the world music charts so it, it's just nice as you said um that people just recognize the authenticity there i think yeah. it's so important and um you have to be genuine in what you do and um that's the family i come from and that's that's what we're all about well you have shared with us an incredible clip so we're going to go to that and then we're going to start discussing uh, your new album which is celtic spells so Let's go ahead and listen. Thank you. 
Yay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you want to dance up. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Oh, well, thank you for putting that up. <laughs> it is so gorgeous. Um, so tell us about Celtic Spells. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is maybe the first one that has a story behind it. It's, it's... Yeah. Okay, so tell us about the story. Yeah, you know, the story of Celtic Spells is about two people falling in love. Uh, they're from different backgrounds and um, they they fall in love and they have a hand fasting ceremony. They get married and um, it's frowned upon. They have to leave their home country to go to the new world. And um, I just think it's... Um, you know it's an ancient story but it's 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 relevant today as well mm -hmm. and it it just uh, lends itself to to telling it in in a musical form in celtic spells and the reason i called it celtic spells of course is celtic but also with the spells uh the whole story is told in four spells so there's two spells to each half of the show and um the show is actually on going to be on on, on tour in uh, on the west coast That's for exciting. st patrick's day and <laughs> st patrick's month and um and also the album um you know it's again got a big orchestration but what i wanted to do with this album is also to to bring together the the high production value of the orchestration but also to have the war the, the rawness of the live music as well like a session mm. in ireland you know like a, a lot of fiddles and um me you know putting a lot of fiddles on and uh, viola and whistle and um i'm i there's even some spoken word as well on there as well and um I have a great team of people involved as well. So it, it depicts the story of Celtic Spells very well, the album uh, and also the show. And uh, I'm really excited because the album is out March the 10th on all streaming platforms. So, so I'm just so excited for it to come out. So by the time this will go out the Sunday, so it'll have been out. So I hope everyone has been streaming and getting, you have physical copies as well, Mairead, is that correct? Yes, I have physical copies as well. Well, thank you very much for, for, for that because yes, go to your streaming platforms now, everyone it's out. And um, the um, pre-orders are actually and uh, now on sale and um, on at Target, you know, Target, the, the big store. So that's, I'm wow. really yeah. happy about that. And also on my website, Website, I do uh, signed physical copies uh, exclusively just from my website but uh, the physical copies then are out properly from March 31st so um, you'll be able to get your your physical copies then or if you've pre-ordered a target and but if you pre-order from my website they go straight out to signed as well so um, you know it's 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 fantastic I'm I'm really really happy I'm so excited and uh, Valley Entertainment uh, is the record company and it's also on sale there as well and um sony i think are bringing it out at the end of march as well march 31st so it's all very exciting can i ask you a little bit about you mentioned some of your team um yeah. share a couple of the collaborators you've been working with on celtic spells yes well as I said, Carl Nesbitt, my brother. <laughs> I, I very rarely do 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 much without Carl <laughs> because I can't. I really need. Him. <laughs> and he's in the most amazing musician and um, absolutely incredible. So he's playing bazooki, baron, low whistle, flute uh, on this album, and um, then the actual tunes from this particular album are very. Uh, some are very well known. And some are very rare. And uh, from my mother's book, uh, Kathleen Nesbitt's book, Fiddle, and uh, that's also on my website. But um, it's, it's just such an amazing book for teachers. Um, and I just did a lot of the tunes out of that because they're very rare, a lot of them. And um, so I just wanted to, to incorporate some rare tunes as well as the very firm favorites that everyone loves. Um, Danny Boy, of course. Wild Mountain Thyme, Parting Glass, and uh, but all the amazing traditional tunes as well for that are great to dance to and, and get all lively to as well. And um, the reason I picked um, for the first two singles, Man of the House and the Fox Hunter, Man of the House 
is being used at the moment um, and has been used in City on a Hill, um, starring Kevin Bacon on Showtime. So that that has reached um, very um, a great popularity, that tune, Man of the House. And so I wanted to pick tunes that people might have might recognize from their favorite shows, like say City on a Hill and Outlander. Of course, the Sky Boat song uh, is from Outlander, which is, um, of course, everyone loves Outlander. It's on at the yes. moment, yeah. the final, final season. And so it's just really fantastic. And I love picking, you know, songs and tunes that people know and they listen to them and they go, oh, that's really, that sounds really fresh. Um, you know, I'm not used to hearing it like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not used to hearing it like that. And so it's um, it, it was just nice to do it in, in a way that people, uh, you know, would be fresher with people as well. And um, so the first two singles are Man, the, Man of the House and Sky Boat Song. And then Celtic Spells is out as well, the whole album. So I hope everyone enjoys it. I think that's so important, though, is having that mix, right? You ha you want to have new pieces because otherwise, yes. you know, if it's just something that's been always there, you know, it's great. But but you also want that familiar touch because I think like when I'm listening to a new album, you want to be pulled back in by something like, oh, this is familiar to my ear. So it's just getting that balance, right? So everyone, please support Celtic Spells. Um, it's it's going to be an amazing album. We'll share it one more time on the screen here. Um, I have just probably the last question, because I know you're doing rehearsals, you need to get back there. Um, but my question to you is, um, in addition to all the wonderful music you're doing, you also have this line of violins. Um, and what are some of the things about a, an instrument that you have loved and that you wanted to make sure you incorporated in your own line? It's such a great question. I grew up um, actually, um, warming up violins and fiddles for um, a friend of the family called Tommy Robinson, who was a violin dater. And he had the most amazing violins, uh, Amatis, uh, Guarneri's, and uh, incredible works of art that would be worth, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, you know. Wow. And so I would get, um, because I didn't have a violin at the time myself, I would get a violin from him. Um, he would he would visit our house, he'd stay and, uh, mom and dad and myself and all the family would be looking at the violins and he'd leave one with me for two months to warm up to sell on because when you warm up a violin um the wood when by playing it a lot every day uh, the wood um becomes very warm and um the sound completely opens up mm. and the violin itself sounds much better to sell you know so that's that was my job <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as as a kid, and um, I loved it, and it 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 really instilled a great love of violins and fiddles in me, and what I wanted uh, an instrument to be, um, and all the violins in my line are uh, handmade. the The starter violin is not the starter violin is very very um, affordable for a beginner, and. You know, so that is, you know, machine made. And then every other violin is handmade, still very affordable. I wanted to bring affordable quality to people. That's really what I wanted to do because I mm. didn't have an instrument for quite a while myself growing up, you know. And I wanted to bring that that um, message to people, you know. So the, the quality is there, yet it's really affordable as your final violin, you know. And uh, and also all the accessories as well. I wanted all those to be included. So I included the Kuhn shoulder rest, which can be $150, you know, yep. itself. And that's included in the outfit. The bow is included, the case, obviously. And um, then my custom rosin is also included. So um, thank you so much for showing it. Um, so it's um, it's very important for somebody to to really be able to play on a good instrument that's mm -hmm. not going to break their parents and not going to break, you know, um, you know, financially, it has to be very affordable. It has to be, you know, it has to take all the boxes. And again, I want it to be authentic in that. And it's never going to make me rich, but I don't care. <laughs> it's just, um, I just want people to have um, quality instruments and, and 
be able to play something that makes them sound better. They're a very for forgiving sound. The sound has been opened up. Um, I personally pick out the violins myself with my luthier, Jeff Salzman, and, and with Colsteins in New York as well. I have a custom bow, which I use all the time. You might have seen it. It's got pink hair. It's a, it's a hot <laughs> hair bow. And um, but that's this that same bow comes in different sticks and different color hair. So you can have an ivory stick with black hair. You know, they're so cool, but yet so strong. The balance is perfect. The balance is like a French bow um, and you you don't have to be afraid of it. You know, you, you, if you're a classical player, you can you're doing an outdoor gig. You can you can leave your 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 priceless French bow at home and, and bring this with you. And it's going to look cool as well, you know, and. <laughs> And it's the one I use all the time now because I absolutely love it, you know. And uh, so that's really what made me start the, the line itself and to, and to bring it to people and my students and um, just the quality, affordable and just to help them play more. And I think that's so important. I love that because I think that's one of the things with classical music when we think about, oh, how do we get more young people and all, all of these things in? One of the things that's very prohibitive can be the cost for yes. lessons and all these things. Yes. So I love that you're doing that. Um, so you have the tour that's coming out. It's starting, what was the date again that it's starting? So the tour is, an, as when people are seeing this, the tour will have already started. So March Amazing. 11th and we're on the West Coast um, and the dates are on moraidnesbit.com and uh, ticket links and all the information about the album and the show and uh, go to all your streaming platforms. But I'm so, do you know what, Natasha, I'm so looking forward to connecting with people at long last in a big concert like Celtic Spells. And um, so this is on the West Coast after all the time that we've had um, after the pandemic and, and yeah. all of that. So I'm so, so happy to connect with people um, on the West Coast uh, for this year. And then next year, we'll have more dates for everybody as well on both coasts. So I'm really looking forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Mairead. It has been an honor to speak with you. And I hope everyone will go out and support. Um, and thank you. Come back again when you have a new album. We'll do another chat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Natasha, for having me.